Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our um, online debate, Cracking the Code to Accountable and Ethical Journalism. My name is Stephanie Chernow from the Ethical Journal Journalism Network. I'm here with uh, Randy Pitch from RJI. Um, recently, we launched a, a new database um, that aggregates ethical codes from around the world and makes them searchable. So for example, you could search by country, by topic, by news organization, and hopefully this initiative will help facilitate more dialogue and better online communications. So Randy, um, would you like to tell us a little bit more about your work at the RJI and how you got involved in this project? So, well, thank you, Stephanie, and it's great to be here. Um, uh, the, the Donald W. Reynolds Journalism Institute's been open since uh, 2008. It's here at the um, University of Missouri School of Journalism. And uh, we were established to help uh, journalism um, sustain itself and thrive in, uh, with, with a lot of different uh, pressures uh, coming from it, from technology and, well, from many different places. And so uh, we do lots of different things here, uh, uh, really all focused um, kind of with unwavering dedication to to making sure that journalism has a long and bright future. Um, and that involves projects with fellows. It involves getting our students uh, to do work with different uh, news organizations. So we're very busy. And um, the codes of ethics uh, were something that we were lucky enough to receive when we opened from uh, Claude Jean Bertrand, who is in uh, w w was a was a journalist in France, who actually was was keeping uh, gathering these codes of ethics and and keeping them uh, sort of as a personal mission, and so he uh, bequeathed them to the Missouri School of Journalism and to then subsequently to RJI, and we. Uh, began the work of putting them into a database and trying to make them available to uh, anyone around the world. Our project now, which we just completed, uh, was to make it, take it to the next step, which was to make it much easier to use this database of codes, uh, make it easier to sort them, search for specific topics, um, like, uh, you know, taking gifts or identifying victims, uh, that, 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 those kinds of issues. So that's, that's kind of how we got involved. Uh, and, and obviously we see this as, as a critical part of our mission uh, because it's so important to, to the future of journalism to make sure that we have, uh, we maintain the bedrock of, of, what what uh, what we've been doing? Absolutely, and I mean, I, I think there's there's definitely been a, a a really great synergy between the RJI and the Ethical Journalism Network. Um, to to explain the EJN for people who might not know our work, um, we we were formed in 2011 as a unifying professional campaign to bring um, news owners, editors, media staff together and just strengthen the craft of journalism. Um, so we're, we're in the business of promoting ethics, good government, um, independent regulation of media content. So, um, you know, we were very um, excited to have uh, teamed up with the RJI. And uh, Randy, as you know, the, the codes have been hosted with you since 2008, um, since we just revitalized the, the project now. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how you've seen the need for media codes to, how they've evolved and how you've kind of seen their need to um, be implemented a little bit more um, in the media during this critical boost in, in technology? Yeah, well, and first thing I, I'll say is that it is one of, you know, we have lots of different things on our website, and uh, but this is, on a regular basis, um, a very popular destination. So that, uh, that is always gratifying to us because 
we know that there's people out there uh, trying to, to, you know, figure some things out or learn some things, and, and that's why the database exists. Um, you know, the, the codes themselves, uh, we, we do get contacted by folks that are updating um, the codes for different uh, issues. Um, and I, but I think that um, there's kind of, there's two ways to look at this. One is that there's, there's certain things that are not going to change because they're so um, crucial to, to how journalism works. And then there's other parts that are under discussion or folks are, are asking questions and, and trying to figure, figure some of these things out. For, for example, um, the Online News Association recently uh, looked at um, how to do, how to kind of update some ethical codes. And they did a project that was called the Do-It-Yourself Ethical Codes. Because they knew that, and, and if someone looks at all the 400 codes that we have in there, you'll find that there's, you know, some, some slight differences in how these things are approached from country to country and from or news organization to news organization. So they, they sort of took the best of everything, but put it into um, this very nice little package so that folks could say, Here's here's what I want to do, and and uh, take you know one from column A, one from column B, and sort of uh, make it their own. So there's there's a constant evolution of these things because there's lots of things that are coming up that are affecting um, uh, how journalism is done. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right that you know the the core concepts of accuracy, independence, impartiality, accountability, showing humanity. These are these all should be international baselines for journalistic work. I think a, a lot of the issues are coming out of just how how technology is being spread with the internet, social media. Um, it, it's a lot easier for misinformation to be to be spread nowadays. Um, and I also think that there's cultural issues between um, media organizations now that the world's getting a little smaller with the internet. Um, for, for example, I know in um, certain countries, it's acceptable to, to take gifts um, to get reporting. It's um, with the, this kind of brown bat, or yeah, this brown envelope journalism um, is seen as being able to cover the costs of, you know, for the journalist um, as their salary is at a very low level, um, whereas the AP wouldn't be able to do this sort of interaction per se. So I mean that that's along the lines again of the um, do-it-yourself um, ethical codes. So I mean what this resource will do as well is kind of allow people to see okay you know this is in practice what different news organizations around the world are doing and um, help people build their code of ethics and they have kind of their own standards that they know what they're getting into before they um, promote their information online, per se. Um, so, Randy, do you want to talk a little bit more about kind of how, how, how can this database be used in a practical sense? Well, um, you know, I think that as events, I mean, there's probably two, two ways. Well, there's lots of different ways to use it. Let's put it that way. So some, some researchers are using it to just kind of uh, Put together their own research on on ethical codes. I think there are opportunities to use it um, to create your own uh, if you're if you're in a news organization. And then from an individual point of view, um, you know, as things develop, uh, you may want to consult the database to see either how other uh, organizations in, a, in your country are using it, how other organizations in other countries are using it. Um, and I think that that's, um, you know, can be very helpful, especially because one of the other issues I think that comes up with ethics sometimes may have generational issues, like you mentioned the, the brown envelope. 
you know, there may, there's different ideas among a younger reporter and an older reporter about how to approach these things. And um, so the database can be used to sort of help you build a case uh, within your own organization, help an organization create its own and, and justify it, um, or just plain, you know, research, that kind of stuff. We had a we had an event here that's sort of um, I don't know it, it, it's not it's not an an wasn't an ethical issue, but it's an interesting issue when you talk about how um, something can happen that might cause you to go to a database like this. So uh, we've had on the campus we've had some um, protests over inclusivity and diversity. We've been in the national news, maybe the international news, um, and uh, on the on the most contentious day, um, we had a student photographer who got an assignment from um, uh, a, a news organization, and he went to take photographs of the protesters, and the protesters had. Uh, uh, people locking arms to create this space around their uh, central area. And he kept adding people, and so the space get, kept was getting bigger and bigger, and he was getting, you know, forced to be further and further away, so his photographs were not going to be as useful. So he was trying to get closer, and they were trying to make him stay away. And um, there was a video that went viral about uh, prof uh, 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 another a professor here who was trying to prevent him from getting closer. And we don't have to talk about that video, but it created this great um, conversation here at the Missouri School of Journalism to talk to the students about the First Amendment and the fact that he had a right to be there as a member of the press. At the same time, the First Amendment protects uh, folks with the freedom of expression and freedom of the right to assemble. And, you know, so it became this kind of tension point. And um, that kind of situation could come up with uh, ethics, you know, and you, you mentioned gifts, but it could, uh, or, you know, identifying children or stuff. And, that's what we see the database as being, having great value of, of if something comes up, you, there's, a, there's a place for you to go and you can say, well, let me, let me get some research on this and see what other, you know, what other organizations think or, um, and, and it will help folks teach like we, we did with the First Amendment, but it'll help folks learn and maybe make better decisions. So that's kind of you know, in terms, that's a long story, long answer to the question of, of how it can be used. Well, I mean, you know, I, I think it brings up a good point that, uh, you know, journalistic expression is not necessarily free expression. We don't believe that journalism is a free for all. Uh, at the EGN, we, we strongly support the fact that journalism is speech that's constrained by ethical values. Um, so you have to know kind of where your lines are and you know that's that's not to say that uh, free speech and ethics are antagonistic concepts um, on, on the contrary it uh, you know it, it promotes um, ethics promotes the speech and the voice of marginalized groups um, so I mean, I, I think that's that's a very important concept to to underline as to why media codes are actually needed. Um, I mean, especially just when um, situations get uh, intense, um, you know, it's it's good to go into you know whether it's a protest, a um, emergency, a disaster. It's it's you have to go into these situations knowing where your boundaries are. Um, so. You're not doing doing damage to the public understanding of what's going on. Um, I mean, yeah. I, I think, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and I think, you know, for us, we have uh, professors here who are experts in the, in the First Amendment as it, as it concerns media. So 
we just had to walk down the hall and talk to them. But most most folks are, you know, not in the same situation. So having a place to go to to try to get that information, you know, we 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 think would be very helpful. Oh yeah, I mean absolutely. I think the the United States is definitely unique in the in the First Amendment. Um, I mean, I, I think in Europe there's a little bit more um, restraint in some senses, just because the the First Amendment isn't um, implemented as much. I mean, free free expression is very important, but um, I think I think with the lines of hate speech, um, it's it's a definitely it's it's a different topic in Africa and Europe than it would be in the U.S. Um, I mean, I, sure. I think, yeah. I mean, I, I, you can talk a little bit more about the coverage of Paris, uh, how it was taken in the U.S. Um, but I mean, I, I think that's a, that's a concrete example of how media codes are definitely needed, and how to maybe look at the situations of what's happening and go online and look at, you know, how to how to cover events as, um, you know, the the terrorist attack that happened in Paris. Um, I mean, there's there is a lot that happened this last week. Um, for those of you who don't know our work, I am based in Paris, so I was able to watch uh, a little too closely of what was going on here. Um, you know, I mean, I think um, you know, last last Friday night uh, there was we, there was a lot of misinformation that was being spread on Twitter. Um, whether it was regular people um, or, or journalists, um, you know, it's just on, on, on Twitter, everybody has access to communication. So I think there's, um, you know, this, this database that we've produced, it's not just for journalists. It is for anyone who's committing acts of journalism. And what I mean by that is anyone who's gathering, um, reporting, and disseminating information. And that, um, that group has definitely proliferated with, with social media. So we, we saw a lot of that on, on Friday night. And I, I think as well, a journalist's job is maybe not necessarily to, to shape the dialogue, but also to do fact checking as well. Um, I mean, I know that I was on, um, I was personally, I was on Twitter Friday night. I saw some tweets of things that weren't necessarily correct. And, um, you know, I was kind of able to add to the dialogue of, you know, I, actually, this isn't the case. Um, there was a, a rumor going around that the Eiffel Tower um, went dark for the first time ever um, in tribute to the victims. And in fact, it was like, no, the, the Eiffel Tower, um, the lights go off at 1 a.m. or Yeah, 1 a.m. regardless of um, what's going on. That's just what it does every night. Um, but with, you know, with everything in chaos, it's easy to spread this type of information. Um, I saw a lot of information on hate speech, which is um, something that the EGN has really worked to develop over the past um, couple of years. So we, we have a lot of materials on hate speech. Um, when we developed this uh, accountable journalism database initiative with the RJI, we added some new information um, regarding hate speech as well. Um, and it, it's, it's really unfortunate to to see how a few a few people can um, influence uh, how the public thinks about um, Muslims, about migrants. Um, there, there's a lot of concern that um, that are un, unfounded and just kind of based on on hate speech. And when the media propagates this type of of speech, it um, you know it, it has it makes the public or the political situation a lot more explosive. Um, so I mean I, I think that's uh, that's definitely something that's more concrete that people can use the database for as well. Um, and then. Yeah, and I think you know some of the things that's the technology is moving so fast, and so some of the things that are happening in social media may you know they may not be directly addressed in the database, but you can definitely go and find some things that would be helpful that will apply to social media, even though it doesn't say Twitter or Snapchat, you know I will not do this in a tweet, something like that. I think we'll, we'll probably get there because social media is here to stay, it certainly seems like. Um, but that's 
that's sort of what we're talking about here is, you know, even though new distribution channels pop up, we still need to make sure we're, 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 we're not, you know, forgetting how it's supposed to work. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think you're absolutely right on that. Um, one of the categories on the database is, uh, is images and, and videos. And uh, with, with a lot of the terrorist attacks that have happened recently, um, there's a lot more violence that's being broadcast immediately. Um, that, I mean, that, that's, you're starting to see more codes of ethics surrounding that, or, you know, kind of people are referring to that more of, you know, how, how, how are we supposed to report this, you know? How, I mean, it's, it's very important not to show gore for gore's sake, um, for example. So it's uh, you have to look at the material you have and see you know ethically how does this push the story forward or are you being sensationalistic? Um, so well, I mean yeah, and I think that's why I mean that's one of the reasons we were so happy to work with EJN because you guys are you know you're you're looking at these these things that are developing, hate speech being a perfect example, which um, you know we need people to sort of look at these things and analyze and and maybe try to make those connections for people about uh, you know we need to look at the rules and figure out how they apply in new areas and I mean we've always kind of had hate speech but it just seems like with social media and how quickly things can um, develop it's become such a Important issue. I mean, absolutely. the 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 new um, the new hot social media tool is Periscope now. Um, for, for for those of you who don't know, it's it's a streaming application that you can use from your your iPhone, so you can stream live from anywhere in the world with your phone. Um, and I, I think Paris really put that application to the test. Um, I, I, Friday night and this following week, actually, I, I saw a lot of people using Periscope to, to cover what was going on in Paris. Not all of them were journalists, um, so that was interesting to see. Um, I know that the police, uh, they definitely had to block off a lot larger of an area when they were um, combating the the terrorists on you know in real time just because they didn't want uh, people on Periscope or reporters giving away their positions and making it a dangerous situation for themselves. Um, so it, it's it's interesting to see um, you know these acts of journalism. Journalism. They might not be journalists, but they you know it's this brand of Periscopers that are. Um, Reporting and it's it's a little it's interesting when that um, that editorial filter is gone. Um, so it will, it will be um, challenging and interesting to see how how ethics on that front will develop. Um, but something I do want to mention is uh, I was following one one person who was a, a a journalist for a news organization, and they would report on Paris and. Um, instead of rambling on uh, about what was going on in Paris, they'd give their report, and then, you know, unlike some broadcasters who would ramble on in speculation and sensationalize and make the stories worse, and in certain cases, not all, um, the the person would be like, "Okay, I gave my report. I have nothing else to say. I'm done," and they would stop the broadcast. And I was like, oh, "That's you know, that's fantastic." So I mean, there, there's definitely uh, you know, opportunities for um, for increased reporting with technology as well. Yep, yep, that's right. So, um, all right. Um, so I, I guess how how else do you think that the media can promote ethical communications, kind of given the, the time that we're living in. Yeah, well, and this is something that I've been starting to look at here. Um, in fact, I'm hoping to do a separate project on, on how the media can um, sort of um, educate and um, explain how journalism works by doing journalism. Um, and sort of what I mean by that is, is what kind of what you were talking about that happened in Paris. It happened here when we had our events. 
that there's all this misinformation or just um, just yeah things that are just completely wrong and they're they get ex they're accepted or there's no response or um, you know they they are um, they make things worse and um, you know that so so the news the news organizations need to figure out how to become how to help address that uh, you know you can't you can't really stop it but too often you know the the practice of journalism um, it, is it takes time and because you need to you need to, you want to make sure you're accurate you need time to find out what actually did happen not what somebody told you happened or what you think happened um, and and social media doesn't allow for that it's everything's now uh, and that immediacy is a issue because sometimes journalism is happening but nobody knows about it so what what I'm really interested in is trying to figure out a way for news organizations to be to get to become part of the conversation quickly and you and in becoming part of the conversation um, sort of show their work if you will so that um, they can people can have a new appreciation for the you know how news is gathered and disseminated and ethics will be part of that because um, you know the the news organizations do things for a certain reason but most nobody knows that but if we can make that more transparent and more apparent um, I think it will uh, help the uh, the whole environment of social media to appreciate that um, that you know there's different kinds of sources of information and some are better than others and maybe if you if it really matters you should you should wait for a, a journalist and not just uh, hope that this this tweet you got is from a reputable source. So in in doing that, I think there's also the idea that um, you know news organizations will be promoting ethical behavior and explaining why certain things are being done or are not being done. And um, you know, hopefully that will help uh, folks um, be be better tweeters and Snapchatters and and the like, because they'll understand too that when they when they start posting things that um, you know they're not a journalist, they didn't talk to the police, they didn't talk to the person, whatever it is. Uh, so maybe that will um, help them understand that what they're doing is something a little different than than journalism. You know, because some sometimes folks say, well. Now everybody's a journalist, you know. Everybody's their own news organization, and um, that's not true. <laughs> and and that's ethics is where you kind of the the rubber meets the road, if you will, you know, because um, that's that's one way that that uh, journalists can can kind of show their you know that there's a line, and you know it it, it can't be crossed. Um, we do have a question, um, Randy. If you wanna, if you wanna try to okay. answer this, um, we got a question. Can you talk about the difference in red light ethics codes that focuses on what not to do versus green light codes that focus on what to do right? Um, yeah. Well, I think you know it's it's easier to for the green light codes. It's easier to tell folks. Um, here's how to do things because for the red light code sometimes there's too many different um, you know uh, scenarios to address I, I, I think like an example of that 
is um, you know gifts like like um, you 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 know don't don't take gifts or or you know that that's like um, the red light code like don't don't take gifts but then you have all these different um, levels right so some codes actually try to address that by saying well don't take a gift if it would um, influence the story uh, or don't take a gift if it's over a certain dollar amount and um, it's very very tricky to to do that because then it's sort of I mean I guess saying don't take a gift over a certain dollar amount um, you know a lot of that then sort of we dilutes the code a little bit because uh, it puts it back into okay well I took this gift because I didn't think it affected the story it didn't affect my personal coverage of the story so and then somebody could dispute that and say no actually I think it did and then you know you sort of in this gray area very quickly so um, still have to do it but it's it's a little it's it's more challenging for the red light codes and I think um, but the but the green light codes I think are you know can be pretty straightforward and and um, uh, just easier to understand and implement yeah absolutely no it, it, yeah that makes you know makes complete sense and I just want to reiterate the the idea that you know even though media policies they may different differ between news organizations and there's certain ethics ethical topics that are more a gray area I think you know really the core concepts of accuracy independence impartiality accountability and I mean I think especially showing humanity they're all baselines for inter, you know journalistic work um, so I mean you know I mean I think especially on Twitter um, I think it was it was not too long ago it was I, th I think it was the shooting in Oregon I want to say um, that uh, there was um, a victim who they sent out a tweet and um, immediately they got over 200 reporters trying to contact them for for information while you know they were essentially being you know and shot at per se um, so I mean I, I think you know first and foremost you have to you know show humanity you think of really what's um, what's in the public interest with your reporting and take into consideration the if there's victims in the situation or vulnerable groups to really take into consideration um, how they're affected by your reporting so um, yep so all right um, Randy, is there is there anything else you you'd like to to add to um, how how this uh, database project can be expanded upon and you know really strengthen the the craft of journalism moving forward? Uh, well, I one thing I I would like to add is that we are uh, and if uh, we are hoping to. Um, keep the site as up-to-date as possible and encouraging anyone who goes there and finds or, or ha, you know has their own codes up there and they have a new version you know there's a email address on the site to um, to send in an updated code and we'll put it right into the database we're also going to keep all the previous codes for their research value, um, just to to see trends in in how things can change in one country or just in the aggregate, um, and um, you know we're talking to to Stephanie and EJN about other things that we can do to try to put more information into into the database that might be helpful. Um, maybe in addition to the codes or expanded into other areas. Um, like Stephanie mentioned, we have some in there about hate speech, but there, there's probably more that we can do. Yeah, ab absolutely. This, this work is going to be expanded upon. So, um, I mean, I'm sure in the, the next uh, couple of months to years, we're going to do more on social media. 
We are, and the the site is currently in English. Um, however, we're we're looking to translate into different languages as well. So we're mm -hmm. we're currently looking for for partners to to do translations with. Um, the I believe the email address is contact at accountablejournalism.org, which people can send updated codes to. So um, this project is very much in its infancy. So uh, we're we're looking to crowdsource more information for for the collective cause. Um, so yep. we're um, yeah we're really excited about moving forward. Yes, we are. All right, so. wonderful. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Randy, for 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 joining me and uh, talking a little bit more about uh, your perspective on codes of ethics um, for all of our viewers. Thank you so much for for joining us. If you if you missed part of this broadcast, uh, it will be uploaded uh, directly to YouTube on the Ethical Journalism Network uh, channel. Um, for you to to view later and share. Um, if you have any questions about the Accountable Journalism project, uh, the website is accountablejournalism.org, um, which you can refer to. It's also, it should be on the showcase bar on this Google Hangout. So, all right. Well, thank you so much. And um, I think that that's, uh, that kind of covers what we, what we wanted to, to do today. So. All right. Well, thanks, Stephanie. All right. Thank you so much. All bye -bye. right. Bye-bye.